there's a great theme that is woven through all of the readings and it's a theme of invitation because it's all about call and response. God's call is to guide us, to guide us to wholeness, to guide us to holiness, and to support us on that path. When we listen to scripture, we hear the word off a page. What I'm going to invite you to do is to put some activity into that. Use your imagination as to what that scene might look like. Jeremiah begins, thus says the Lord. And whenever you hear that opening, thus says the Lord, it's a call to like, listen up, pay attention. There's something important following. And in Jeremiah today, thus says the Lord, means Shout with joy, the Lord has delivered his people. Now, that kind of activity is fairly new within the church today. The church I grew up in back in the 50s and 60s was one in which you went into the church very quietly and you knelt down and you did not talk. And during the celebration of Eucharist, all you saw was the back of the priest. And so you sat. You said the rosary. You tried not as a child to fidget around. And you really didn't understand very much unless you understood Latin and had memorized the prayers in response to the Mass. It truly was what I would consider a spectator sport. Today, thanks be to God, it's different. We get to engage in this special. Now, the psalm, you know, God has done wonderful things for us. And, and we, we're filled with joy and we're filled with laughter and music. And so that's really evident in this community because people are filled with joy and they do sing out and they become an integral part of the celebration to which they've been invited. What a wonderful experience that provides. Now, when we get to, to uh, the psalm also talks about, you know, the captives were set free. Can you imagine what it must have been like to live under the thumb of another ruler, to always have to worry about what you said, and what you did, how you did it because you were always being watched. And now, these people who lived in captivity had been calling out to God, God, save us, come to us, set us free, listen to our petitions. And God always listens to our petitions and that's exactly what God did. He came and he set them free and he returned them to that which was familiar. And he didn't just take them back and set them there. He provided for them everything that they could possibly need as they returned. That's the same with each one of us. God provides for us exactly what we need. And when we need that, if we simply call out to God, God gives that unconditionally loving response. The, the gospel. Jesus responds to the cry of the outcast and he heals him. He stops. He says, bring him over. And when the blind man comes over, you have to put yourself in that position. Being a blind man sitting by the road, you, you had to be a very trusting soul because you didn't know what people were giving to you. If they were giving you alms so that you could live, what he did was he would put them in his cloak next to him so that he could know where they were. Now when Jesus comes and he knows by that faith what he's going to ask and what he can do, he jumps up, he springs up, he throws his cloak aside, not caring about whatever is in it, and he comes 
and he stands before Jesus. And Jesus asks him the question, what do you want me to do for you? He says, I want to see. And Jesus restores his sight. And he follows him on the way. He follows him on the path. His life from that moment was forever changed because now he was acceptable in the community. Remember, in those days, if you had an infirmity, it was thought there was something wrong. You committed sin or your parents committed sin, and so you were on the outside of society. He's now back in society. What a wonderful gift. And it all happened because he had the courage to call upon the Lord and ask him for what he needed. And in each of these accounts, there is not once a mention of the worthiness that is a part of the activity. Jesus doesn't look at him and say, hmm, you're blind, we know why. Should I, shouldn't I? He just simply opens his heart to that experience and cures him. So how many of us in this assembly today have ever called upon God in our time of need and we were, we were answered and we were part of God's mercy and God's forgiveness and God's caring and we, we knew things were changing for us because of God's response to us. So on this journey to wholeness that God has called us to walk on with him, God always gives us a sincere response. And that response is an invitation to discipleship. How to truly be a follower of Jesus walking on the path. How to be connected to him in prayer. To be a part of that love and to welcome others who journey along with us on that path. The call to discipleship. Well, what are some of the characteristics, do you think? We heard about them in the scripture tonight. Persistence. You have to be persistent if you're going to walk the walk of faith. Who was persistent in the scriptures? Was it not Bartimaeus? Son of David. Son of David. Be quiet. Son of David. The more they tried to shut him up, the more he tried to engage. Who is the committed response? Clearly Jesus, clearly the Lord, in all of the experiences, setting the captives free, telling people, this is, life is meant to be shared, there must be laughter, there must be music, and of course, what else comes with music? Dancing. You have to have all of that activity together. Now, so within our community, as God calls us to wholeness and holiness, we, especially at this time of the year, see our community take a particular shape. And that shape is to be found in the men and the women who are looking for that relationship with God. So in this assembly, tonight. How many of you have come into the church through the rite of Christian initiation for adults? Stand up. Stand up. Look around, sisters and brothers. These are the people that knew, just like Bartimaeus, that there was something more for them in their life. Now, how many of you in this assembly have ever been a sponsor for someone coming through the Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults. You please stand up. Do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Do you see how important it is for the community to pull together, to make this relationship with God strong and loving and vibrant? And it, it takes everybody working together. You may sit down. Thank you. So I want to encourage you, if you have never been a sponsor, perhaps you might consider it. Perhaps you might take that first step on the journey and walk with our catechumens and our candidates as they seek out 
and want to know the Lord more deeply. We also have the same wonderful experience with the children. The children are preparing for confirmation and they're preparing for first Eucharist. And of course, before they can do that, they have to experience first reconciliation. And I've heard these stories. And I can't share them with you. <laughs> Except to tell you, it's a tremendously rewarding experience to hear these young people know what it is to change their behavior, to become more obedient. And if we're looking for an example of obedience, we only have to look to Jesus and we only have to look up there as a constant reminder that he was obedient to his father out of love. And in that experience of love, it overflowed and it came to all of creation. We still benefit from that experience. And we heard that in the old days, the priest, the high priest who was chosen, had to go every year and make atonement for sin and had to sacrifice and make atonement for sin, his own and those around him. Jesus did that for us once and for all out of his love. And you know in those days there were just two classifications of people. There were Jews and there were Gentiles. And you, my sisters and brothers, along with myself, were the Gentiles. And Jesus said, Jews and Gentiles are co-heirs to salvation, to the kingdom of God. Can you imagine the rejoicing that went on when that was announced? It opened for us a whole new pathway. And that's why as God guides us to wholeness and holiness, he does so out of love. So the children preparing for first Eucharist and confirmation. How many of you remember your confirmation? Me too. We had time release, because I'm a lot older than a lot of you. And so I went to public school, and on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock, we were let out of school because we had to go down to the Catholic school attached to the church and meet with sister. And there was no fooling around. And we went into church, and we practiced. And she had that cricket. On one click you went down, and one click you got up, and you went in, and when you knelt down, she'd stand there watching to be sure that there was nothing attached to the pew. You were kneeling upright, straight up. That was in preparation for First Eucharist. Confirmation, sister would come and she'd say, you know, the bishop is going to question you. You better have the answer. Oh, the, talk about the fear of God. I didn't have to worry about God, I had sister. <laughs> and then she'd say, in those days, the belief was you will be a soldier for Christ. And in that confirmation, the bishop is going to whack you on the face to reinforce that. And so we, we would go in and, and you'd stand there at the confirmation in front of the bishop and you'd, you'd go. And all the bishop did was he just took his hand gently, put it on your cheek, and that was it. Sister, on the other hand, when practicing, <laughs> she, she let you know. But these experiences make us who we are in our life of faith. And it's an experience that continues to grow on the journey because when we are committed to discipleship and we are committed to the way, our faith gets deeper and stronger and we know what it means to live that out. And so we do so with laughter and music and great joy. And so today, we realize how blessed we are. How blessed we are that have a God who loves us as much as he does 
and who continues to support us and encourage us and be with us. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.